Our topic today is uh, heaven and hell in visual art as opposed to in literature. And, and it is, of course, a vast topic since humanity sees itself as having a stake in the subject. Hence, their visual representation has been all-pervasive prior to the secularization of modern thought. However, the manner in which heaven and hell are perceived and the level of attention given to each has varied greatly over the centuries. For instance, evocations of hell as terrifying hereafter filled with demonic creatures that torture the damned were once widely depicted, very largely fell from sight during the age of the Enlightenment. Thereafter, perhaps taking its place, our present earthly existence has itself sometimes been represented as a form of hell on earth, as in the art of Goya, Max Beckman, and in our own time, for instance, Jerome Witkin. Meanwhile, during the same Enlightenment era, heaven lost its traditional Christian prerequisites, and when represented was conceived either as a harmonious earthly society comprised of the social elect, as in the art of Watteau, for example, or was seen as some light and happy realm in the sky, entered not through the narrow gate of the church or over the bridge of a cross traversing time and eternity, but rather spread as an expansive blue canopy over our heads, gaily peopled by the socially elect, dressed in shimmer, shimmering silk costumes, as in the art, for instance, of Tiepolo. For centuries before, however, heaven and hell were figured in more traditional Christian terms as conceived by fertile imaginations fired by the rhetoric of the church and nourished by images passed down by tradition. I think the first fundamental point to make is that heaven and hell are figured, the ways they are figured, depends significantly on an understanding of each as respectively a form of restoration and due punishment, the idea of restoration and due punishment. Thus, images of heaven presuppose the notion of paradise garden from which humanity was expelled as a consequence of the fall into sin. Heaven, thus, takes on something, as you can see in, this, uh, in the detail here in the lower part of this huge Ghent altarpiece of Jan van Eyck, and uh, perhaps uh, the reference to the fall here with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel references the fall, therefore, and the whole process of redemption leading to restoration. Then you get a better view of the images of heaven here as, as a kind of uh, a restored paradisical garden centered on a well of living water, as well as constituting a celestial city, which you can see glimpsed in the background here, the New Jerusalem, as inspired by the book of Revelation. Jan van Eyck's altarpiece, then, is a classic example of an of a orthodox Christian view of heaven. By the same measure, representations of hell presuppose the nature of humanity's original sin, which for centuries was understood as essentially a corruption of the five senses, with carnal lust at its core and twisted desires of all forms as its consequence. Here you see a print just from the eve of the Reformation, 1511 in Germany, by Hans Baldung Green, uh, representing the fall of the human race with a clear, very clear emphasis, co correlation between the idea of fall into sin and carnal lust. Hell, then, was represented as a domain to which the fallen are consigned and in which the punishment typically fits the crime. Examples are all pervasive. Characteristic of the hell scenes of Hieronymus Bosch from the late 15th and early 16th century, as in the right-hand panels of Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. I'm sorry, hell is so dark you can hardly see it in our auditorium. That's maybe as it should be, even in a Presbyterian church. But uh, typical, as in Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights or his Hay Wain, which I'm not going to show you. This is his famous painting of the Garden of Earthly Delights. The left panel shows God the Father presenting Eve to Adam with the fountain of life behind them and the harmony between humanity, the animals, and nature. The, and then comes the fall. And with the fall, the, the, garden, the, the fountain of life 
becomes a fountain of eternal youth or something like it, a fountain of, uh, of renewal and pleasure, and, and of youth and pleasure, while the fall of humanity has spawned, as you see on the center panel, an endless human craving to satisfy their perverted carnal desires. In the right-hand panel, which regrettably you can't see in our light here, humanity reaps the consequences of their sins in a realm of confusion and perversion, essentially an anti-world or hell. And that's a pretty important idea that I could find in most uh, representations of hell, that hell is an anti-world in which all normality is perverted and often represented by human beings Dignity being perverted by being represented upside down and very often to uh, devils attacking their bodies and most specifically their genitalia, which ties in with that earlier image I showed you of the basis of uh, association of carnal lust with the fall. Thus, to, to sort of pull those major ideas together, the way that heaven and hell are most frequently figure rests on these two notions of a restored paradise on the one hand and of an anti-world in which every good is perverted and the punishment tends to fit the crime. Now, I'm, from now I'm going to, having given you that sort of major picture, I want to show you some of the variations at different historical periods because they're pretty significant. In the very earliest Christian art from the time before the recognition of Christianity by the Roman Empire, uh, the Christian art and the representation of heaven seems to have been shaped by the repeated need to express the hope of deliverance from earthly woe into a pastoral paradise. And this is represented in an extremely schematic and sketchy form in this rather poor image of a good shepherd with two sheep either side and birds in trees packing the fruits of the trees. Um, the idea of deliverance from earthly woe into a pastoral paradise is not exclusively Christian. This image, both its style and the specific motives, are both derived with almost without any modification from pagan Roman funerary art, thus from pagan tradition. The earliest Christian Roman catacomb art is all typically highly schematic, as this is here, and in form and content simplified form of pagan Roman art. With the Roman imperial recognition and promotion of Christianity, the materials become more luxurious, often mosaic, as here, you can't see it, but this is a detail from a church in Ravenna with the whole surface covered with glimmering mosaics, and the images are much more elaborate and much more sophisticated in design and detail. That, but the underlying theme remains essentially the same, for instance, this is a mausoleum in Rosanna where you have once again the good shepherd, in this case dressed in imperial robes, purple and gold, with his sheep, and above here a fountain, a kind of symbolic urn, as a symbolic fountain of life with birds nourished by the water. And this is an image again like, uh, that goes back to about the, at least the time of Alexander the Great when you can find it in Alexander the Great's palace and it's repeated over and over again in Christian art as a kind of symbolic reference to paradise and to drinking from the fountain of life. And again, the image of the Good Shepherd goes back to about 8th century BC in, in pre-Christian tradition as an idea of humanity, of human caring. And here is one typical detail that you find over and over again in mosaic with this urn and this these trees and plants, in this case a vine, flowing out of the urn, which is a clear reference back to a restoration of the paradise garden. And these birds are often shown pecking the grapes, the idea of being nourished on the vine, the blood of Christ, but also the idea of the soul in paradise, a metaphor of the human soul delivered from its labors and able to be freely nourished once again from the tree of life. But by contrast, in early Christian and Byzantine art, there's almost no reference to hell, particularly in early Christian art. That changes radically in the medieval period and in the under the monastic movement. 
the monastic culture of the medieval period brought about a very significant change of emphasis. By now, the entire culture was nominally Christian, but full nevertheless of violence, pillage, and rape. The secluded monastic cloister was often cultivated as a symbolic paradise garden centered on a fountain. It served as both a retreat from the evils of the world and a symbol of a better world to come. It was the exclusive province of the monastic community and the locus for their meditations. Uh, if you don't mind going back to the previous slide, I just want to make one point here that in this art too there's a, introduces us to another critical theme that runs through a lot of this material, and that is the idea of the, role, the mediate, mediatory role of the church in leading us to heaven. In this case, the altar where you receive the sacraments, the intercession of the saints, leading you to this heavenly realm which is variously populated in this image. That idea that you come, that you are restored to heaven through the sacrament and the mediation of the church is extremely critical to most of these representations, at least until the time of the Enlightenment. So back then to the medieval monastic culture, and my point is here that for the monks themselves, the cloister garden, as you see here, with its often with a fountain in its center or at some point in the garden, represented both a kind of a escape from the world, but also a foretaste of the better world to come. But this is the domain where the monks go around having their meditations in the cloister around the side. It's their exclusive world. Uh, the, the lay visitors to the portals of, their, of these abbeys where the lay people would have come through, you typically find a representation of last judgment and then a division of humanity into the elect, which is always a very orderly field uh, with everything sort of vertical and horizontal and graceful angels usher you into heaven. And on, the, on Christ's left side, the sinister side, uh, the, the jaws of heaven open. And uh, in some of the most cryptic but um, concise images, you find these gruesome hell scenes, uh, such as you've seen carved by human hands. They're unbelievable, and I could show you endless examples of these. Here, the great Leviathan opens his mouth. Notice here the keys and the locks on the gates of, he of hell, and humanity is thrust through his mouth and shoved into this pit uh, over which presides this demonic creature, and they're tortured in their all kinds of different ways. And according to the imagination of the sculptors, you find every kind of different torture, and I'm not going to show you more of those. Such hell scenes, however, were almost invariably presented, as you saw here on the, right, on the other side, in conjunction with representations of an orderly heaven where the blessed are ushered in. And quite often then down on either side of the portals to either side, you had representations of, for instance, the wise and foolish virgins and the virtues and vices, implying that choices now have consequences hereafter. And that kind of didactic role is all pervasive in medieval art. Contemporary manuscript illumination, we're looking at the 12th century here. This is from a Winchester Bible in England of about 1150. In such manuscript illumination, the artist exercised no less vivid imagination in presenting their readers with images of the jewels of hell. I'm afraid the image is cropped on the left. There's an angel here, very elegant angel, locking the, uh, uh, the jaws of hell to keep people in. Uh, and you will find within, within the jaws of hell that ev the Satan is ever ready to consume the rich, the famous, and the noble of the worldly order. Both kings, queens, and clergy, bishops, princes, feature among the damned, while the repetition of upside-down figures, which is very evident in this case, signifies the loss of human dignity and the inhumanity of the devilish tormentors in this perverse anti-world, literally an upside-down world. And that idea is very frequently repeated. 
the image of the last judgment and the consequent separation of the saved and damned and related images of heaven and hell are all pervasive in medieval and late medieval art. Just to give you a couple of the other examples, two prominent late medieval Florentine images must have haunted the images of its citizens a and were echoed, for example, in the subsequent preaching of Savonarola. Ev what you're looking here is the vaults of the baptistry of Florence Cathedral. Thank you. Every Florentine cit citizen was brought as a baby to be baptized under these vaults. On entering the baptistry, no one can fail to be impressed by the gilded mosaics that adorn the entirety of the vaults overhead. And as well as narrating the whole idea of salvation from the creation of humanity through the fall, the incarnation of Christ, the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. All of that is figured here, but the presiding over it all is Christ gesturing in two ways with the marks of, of the cross on his hands to indicate his right to be our judge. In this type side, the always on the right, the blessed, and then the damned here. You can't really see the details, but being uh, thrown into hell and underneath his feet figures coming out of their tombs to uh, face last judgment. Just imagine, every time you went to a baptism in Florence, you were presented by this kind of image in, in which you always had the sense of Christ as judge presiding over your human existence. A pretty scary thing. And that also is where the mediating role of the clergy comes into play. And in this case, particularly the role of the Dominican order. This is in another church, famous church in Florence, and on here is a representation. Notice here Florence Cathedral in the foreground of various representatives of the Dominican order. These dogs in the foreground has to do with the idea of the Dominican, the Dom, uh, Domine Carne, as they were called, the dogs of the Lord, Domine Carne Dominican, that hunt out heresy. And they also hunt out people who like to music, make music and dance because they're right candidates for hell. Uh, well, uh, yes, musicians sit up and bear that in mind. Musicians, not artists for once, are what cause visual artists, are what cause people to fall into sin, at least in the ma late medieval culture. Today it's different. Well, while Peter clearly holds the keys to the gates of heaven, you're not left in any doubt whatsoever that it's the Dominicans who hold the transit visas. So if, if you need to go to heaven, uh, you see there the role of the Dominican in, in that mediating role. It's very clearly pointed out. Then the Renaissance brings about a pretty significant change to all of this. Initially, it's a change of form, and ultimately, it's a change of content. Uh, I'm going to start with Nether the ne uh, Renaissance in Northern Europe, in Netherlandish art, because it was far more traditional theologically and artistically and far less influenced by classical humanism than the art of Italy. And it manifests greater religious continuity with the medieval vision of both heaven and hell. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a little panel by Jan van Eyckel, one of his immediate followers, with a crucifixion on one side and then a last judgment with heaven and hell separated by the figure of St. Michael in this case, and then a devilish uh, sort of skeletal figure whose wings make a great canopy of separation. It's marvelous to see the, the oceans yielding their dead, the earth yielding their dead, and then all facing judgment with the, uh, Christ, uh, Christ with Mary and John either side as prime intercessors for humanity. Notice the extraordinary spatial representation of this image compared to the medieval gold grounds that you've seen before. And it's in this kind of making it more concrete, making it more visually believable, that's so typical of the Renaissance period. It renders it more lifelike with the movement of the human body in a credible spatial field. The result was both images like this and that of Hieronymus Bosch. The impact of more credible figures moving in more expansive spatial fields can also be apprehended rather effectively in the next image. This is about 1415. Uh, it's in a manuscript illumination from the Limburg brothers, The Devil Tormented in Hell. It was made for one of the most wealthy men in France, the Duc de Berry. In this case, the grid 
and the bellows here, these huge bellows, and this extraordinary image of Satan spewing out of his mouth all these burnt souls was taken from the vision of Tundale, a 12th century English text that was still widely circulating in Europe. But the, the vividness of hell, and you will find in many, many of these images, again, the genitalia of these devilish tormentors are greatly exaggerated and often to human beings uh, have forks pushed into their genitalia by, by little demons as a way of, of, of sort of the punishment fitting the crime in the framework that I offered earlier. In Italy, it's somewhat different. During the late medieval and early Renaissance periods, inspired by developments in pictorial representation, artists such as Giotto in Padua or Fra Angelico in Florence produced more lifelike versions of the medieval schema of the Last Judgment with humanity divided into separate destinations with heaven and hell, having the characteristic attributes but rendered more lifelike. Building from them, Luca Signorelli, who was essentially Florentine trained, and Michelangelo, also a Florentine, we'll come to him in a moment, his more, Signorelli's more famous successor, rendered the medieval vision of the Last Judgment with all the visual realism of Renaissance art, placing particular emphasis on the articulation of the musculature of writhing human bodies. So here the kind of, the, the, it's the tension of the muscles of the human body that give this sense of torment and pain. In this case, it's uh, three angels, Michael and two others, uh, consign uh, the, the damned to hell who are carried off uh, by various uh, demonic creatures, thrown into the mouth of hell, so it's all still pretty traditional stuff, but then all these writhing bodies in which demons, typically with green-colored bodies, struggle and torture people. For instance, this woman is having her toes ripped off. In another case, someone is having their ear pulled off and things like that. But it's the, the sheer physicality of the body that turns your stomach over in the sense of a, of a feeling of this is a horror one might, might want to avoid. Uh, Michelangelo's more famous Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel done about 30 years later, 1530s in the Vatican, this is probably well known to all of you, follows in this same direction with the extraordinary articulation of the human body, the figures rising out of the ground, ascending up towards heaven, and, so, and then this uh, powerful image of Christ as judge uh, with a Herculean body and a Polonian face that reaching back to classical antiquity again. In this case, the two prime intercessors, Mary and John, uh, are represented John strong and naked here. Uh, but Mary turns away in horror, and Christ pays no attention to her intercession, raises his arm more in judgment uh, towards the dam than he does the gesture, the other gesture of blessing towards the blessed. If you think of that equal representation we saw in the baptistry in Florence, this is a rather different change of emphasis with a great deal of emphasis on the damned. A and then this poor melancholic figure contemplating his fate, others being thrown down into the mouth of hell, and one cynical priest who was making fun of Michelangelo uh, while he was painting this gets his portrait here, uh, in here, coiled with serpents around his body, standing naked here. And notice also Sharon's boat sort of carried in from classical antiquity, carrying people across the divide here. It's a pretty potent image. And then always very moving to people is to realize that uh, St. Bartholomew, who was flayed alive, holds his, uh, his pelt here into which Michelangelo has painted his own features. Uh, whether that is a sense of, as he said, that he felt he'd been flayed alive by his patrons, the popes, the papacy, or whether it was his sense of horror, uh, Im uh, imminent uh, judgment is difficult to tell, but it's an extraordinarily moving image. In the Renaissance as well, as in earlier Christian art, we also find representations that stress the mediating role of the church sacraments in opening the path to heaven. This is the 
uh, Raphael's famous decorations in the Stanza de Signatura in the Vatican with the more famous School of Athens on this wall, opposite wall. But opposite it is this dispute on the sacrament, which uh, I give it to you here in its setting. And so you can see the way also the perspective is used to draw your eye into the space and through the organization inevitably towards the sacrament and then through to the sacrament to the heavenly realm above. Here is a closer view in which you, you get less of a sense of how you're drawn in, but you can see more clearly the role of the sacrament and the mediation of the church, which is your sort of ticket of admission to this upper heavenly realm. One of the things that's very fascinating in this image too is that when you study it formally, everything above this line of clouds representing the heavenly realm is based on circles, where everything below is based on straight lines and rectangles. So sort of straight lines and rectangles below, circles, speaking of infinity, no beginning, no end, above. So the visual impact of the use of perspective, perspectival illusionism becomes even more dramatic and transformed at the hands of other Renaissance artists, most notably at Palmer Cathedral uh, in the, at the hands of Correggio. Palmer's a beautiful city where we get our Parmesan cheese from, a little bit north of Florence, wonderful place to go if only for its cheese. But for the worshiper entering the cathedral and advancing down the dark nave, very dark nave, to receive the sacraments at the high altar, approaching the altar, one becomes aware of this brilliant light opening above one's head. Drawn to the light, looking upwards, one is utterly confounded, and photographs just do no justice to this at all. One is confounded to find oneself gazing out beyond the confines of the material world, gazing up into the firmament of heaven, which is filled with that whole cloud of witnesses that awaits us. And Correggio certainly loved to paint legs. There are at least 3,000 legs of the witnesses dangling all over the place, hanging out of the clouds. They're quite wonderful. And then the Virgin Mary's legs, most of all. Uh, she's carried up into heaven, and by extension ourselves, as we are joined with Christ in the sacrament of the Mass of the Eucharist, which we receive below this cupola. A and also in the four corners, you have images of the four evangelists who mediate this word to us. Uh, the power of art to evoke wonder, awe, and hope has rarely been so potently articulated, but since few go to Palmer, most people are not aware of this extraordinary spectacle. With the counter-reformation and the, med uh, the mediation of the church becomes an even more critical theme, as you can imagine, but also the need to counter Protestantism. Such heavenly visions as this take on various forms during the Catholic Counter-Reformation, taking on special significance as a form of persuasive visual rhetoric, instilling in the believer the importance of the church as a mediating agency through which heaven could be reached. I'm going to show you one very modest image, but also very uh, telling image, and this is El Greco's altarpiece in a church, a modest church in Toledo of 1586, of the burial of a particular count. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because it emphasized so very, very forcefully in a way I think that as Protestants we'll be uh, sensitive to the idea of the mediating role of the church. Not only is this dead count held by people richly garbed in their ecclesiastical robes, but notice the role of this figure here, this priest here, who sort of he has his back to us and is perhaps uh, uh, the most tactile or most proximate figure in the whole, uh, uh, as is this figure too. They're very proximate to us, that is, as viewers. And yet they then lead, they look, and we look through their eyes, to, or particularly through his eyes, and perhaps to some extent this man's eyes, towards this heavenly uh, uh, vision where an angel carries up the soul of the dead count to be received by Christ, again with the two typical intermediaries, Mary and John the Baptist, who mediate for you, and not to be left out, of course, is Peter, who dangles his keys. Uh, you think of the symbolism of those keys we've seen before. Dangles his keys because that's the sign of his authority when Christ said to Peter, 
What you bind on earth is bound. What you open in heaven is opened. That key, Peter, as the, as the gatekeeper of heaven, is very clearly articulated, clearly in opposition to some of the views of Protestantism. This is a modest image. The next one is rather more spectacular. Here I'm taking you to the church of St. Ignazio in Rome. I wish we could all go there this afternoon. It is an extraordinarily moving place to visit. And this was a church where all Jesuit priests were trained and those sent out onto the mission field. And I emphasize the latter, particularly the idea of those that were being prepared for missions. And as, this, as you go through this extraordinarily rich kind of Reformation church, as you walk down the nave, if you come to this point here and look up over your head, apart from everything else to be seen all around you, and it doesn't do justice to us in this space, space, but what opens above your head is a sense of the actual architecture of the space being extended into a greater space above the vaults of, of, of the building and then opening up. And then people flow through freely. There's an extraordinary kind of breaking of nature as grace spills through and breaks boundaries between the natural world and the heavenly world. There's a natural flowing through from our world to theirs. So you have the sense of through the church, you come out of this material world into a spiritual reality. A and the core of this then is the, the cross of Christ is held up at the center. And from Christ comes this beam of light which uh, strikes the heart of St. Ignatius. And then from his heart, it radiates out through his teaching to the four corners of the earth. And at the end of the extremity of each of these beams, you see representations of Africa, Asia, America, and Europe. And in the American one, you have some wonderful Indians who are throwing unbelievers out of heaven into hell. And there are images like that all the way around if you have t time to explore it. So it's a fabulous kind of image, again, of how it is through the mediation of this order that, and through the light of Christ as propagated by this order that the truth is spread throughout the world and in turn, through that message, you may enter heaven. It's a very, in my mind, very potent image. How in the kind of Reformation is a rather rarer subject than it was in previous century. But Catholics created various images of, of rebel angels being thrown out of heaven. Not a very good slide, but this is, again, a Jesuit church. This was the headquarters of the Jesuit order, but not their seminary in Rome, Il Gesù. And in the vaults of this building, you get a similar opening up, which is it's not nearly tactile enough in this image. It's not nearly convincing enough, but again, the breaking down between natural and spiritual barriers, the idea of grace breaking through into the natural realm. But what I'm particularly showing you here is this crowd here uh, uh, who are all being thrown out of heaven uh, uh, and upside down, tormented, a sort of extension of what we've seen before, but now literally tumbling over your head uh, and into your space. And very consciously, if you pick up some of the other references in the church, this is a reference, intended reference to the fate of heretical Protestants. So if you are a Protestant, you better watch out. Uh, another such image from uh, Rubens, a Catholic artist, Rubens, who worked for all the major churches uh, throughout Europe. Uh, this is a very large uh, panel uh, that he painted as about nine foot by seven, seven foot, the fall of the damned. Uh, and again, you have just a tiny little reference here to, to the uh, St. Michael with his shield driving everybody uh, out of heaven. The, the green devils, which we've seen in much older medieval art, and then all these demons torturing people in various ways, and the flames of hell, and, and figures being dragged down upside down big, fat, sloppy bodies. And look at this figure here. You have to think it's just a short walk from the beer garden to the, to the hell when you look at this. Uh, but it was certainly intended as a rebuke to heretical Protestants and, as well, an admonition to Catholics to avoid the Protestant heresy. The Enlightenment brings a radical change in this whole story. And the beginnings of the modernist vision of both heaven 
and ultimately with the Romantics, a modernist vision of hell. Very briefly, in the 18th century, in the Enlightenment period, heaven comes typically to be seen as a light and happy realm, as in this fabulous ce uh, ceiling fresco by Tiepolo, which is uh, actually, this is a sketch for it. The original is in Wolfsburg uh, Palace in Germany, where heaven is seen as some light and happy realm in the sky, entered, note, not through the narrow gate of the church and not over the bridge of a cross traversing time and eternity, but rather spread as an expansive blue canopy over our heads, gaily people with the socially elect dressed in shimmering silk costumes. At one time that seemed all right to me, but I don't think it does now. With Romanticism, you see the beginnings of a modernist vision of hell. With the Romantics, a modernist vision of hell began to be expressed as a sense that hell is not something confronted after death and judgment, but is all too often experienced in the domain of the prince of this world, experienced namely as hell on earth. The terrible violence of the revolutionary years in Europe is one such instance, most notably in the art of Goya. Goya drew some of his inspiration from classical myth mythology and some from medieval hell scenes. For instance, this image, which reminds one of the things we saw, for instance, Limburg brothers of people being eaten by monsters, at the same time speaks to the classical mythology, mythological story of Saturn or Father Time consuming his children, the horrendous realization which comes to us, all of us at some point of time, that we're born, is time that conceives us. We're born in time, but it's time that consumes us. The horrendous notion, in a sense, that nature consumes its own. It is also striking in the work of Goya, and I'm sorry you can't see this, but since it's close to lunchtime, it's probably just as well. It's striking that Goya, to visualize hell on earth, he reached back to the repertory of medieval hell scenes and then relocates them within our world or rather in the darkest reaches of our world. Here is an image of cannibals preparing their victims, but you can also think of all those graphic images he made of the disasters of the war, a man's inhumanity to man, which were widely spread around the time of the French Revolution. Modern skepticism and a naturalistic worldview have taken their toll on the artistic vision of both heaven and hell. As for heaven, if heaven is to be found in the 20th century, the all-pervasive image of advertising will try to persuade us that it's only to be found on earth. When we worship at the shrine of mammon and make our due sacrifices for safe sex, sleek cars, and luxury vacation homes. Here this image by Matisse of an odalisque has some of the references and associations that we earlier saw with the paradise garden, the vase, the plants, the, the sense of here is free food and free sex, the idea of a paradisical existence in which you don't have to work and all you have is the comforts of the body coming to you freely. It's clearly a reference to that, back to that paradisical image. Look at the richery, richness of this, but in highly secularized form. In a naturalized vision of reality, perhaps for most people, the only faint taste of heaven is found in the fleeting intimacy of the bedroom. Yet even there, for the consistent naturalist, as Francis Schaeffer has once pointed out, any sense of communion is stripped of all its metaphorical potential to inspire hope. Thus, an essentially physical act in an ultimately meaningless universe what is potentially uplifting in a metaphorical sense as well as a physical sense becomes itself a source of despair. Where does that leave modern human beings? Perhaps the Russian Jewish artist Mark Rothko represented the spirituality of many of his generations, this is the late 60s, when he painted for a university interdenominational chapel in Houston, Texas, a series of large, empty panels still on a Christian triptych format. This is divided into three parts, two like a Christian triptych. And yet they're covered only with dark 
melancholic tones of deep plum shading off into near black. As one critic commented, all the world has been drained out of them, leaving only a void. The artist's patron has succinctly expressed what many have felt conveyed by these murals, the tragic mystery of our perishable condition, the silence of God, the unbearable silence of God. What then of hell in the 20th century? If commercial artists working for advertisers would lure us to seek heaven on earth, their fine art counterparts have concluded that the unbearable silence of God also has its counterpart, a sense that hell is not a state that awaits us after death, but one that confronts us here and now in the terrible silence of the night, or even worse, in the clear light of day, in a world that hell is incarnate in the misery of the human condition. The English artist Francis Bacon, who produced this image in the 50s, expressed the sense of anguish human alienation in the shadow of the supposed death of God with peculiar irony. He did this by making variants, as in this example, of a painting by the 17th century Catholic artist Velasquez of the Counter-Reformation Pope Innocent X, where Velasquez depicted the Pope as a man of assured confidence. Bacon transformed this icon of faith into an emblem of humanity's scream into the void. And you can almost feel the kind of pain and anguish of the visual cause if you just imagine my fingernails scratching down that image as, as lines come down, this kind of sense, ah, comes all the way through the image. In commenting on these works, Baton acknowledged that artists like Velasquez and Rembrandt were perhaps, as he put it, slightly conditioned by certain types of possibilities. He couldn't imagine faith as being possibly more than that for anybody, which man now, he went on to say, has had canceled out for him. What then remains is the sense of hell on earth. The sense of hell on earth has preoccupied a number of different artists and been expressed in various forms. Here I show you Ed, the Californian artist Ed Keenholz, The State Hospital of 1966. And you think of also that book, One Flew Over a Cuckoo's Nest, and I can't remember the name of the author. Ed Keenholz made this chilling installation, certainly not to decorate apartments, but as a means to expose the wretchedness of the human condition. The sense of abandonment is both painful and poignant. You realize there's only one person here, and all the rest is his thoughts. He's not thinking, when is that student from the um, Wheaton Youth Group coming down to visit me? He's not thinking, when is the nurse coming to clean me? He lies there in his own dirt, for no one hears, no one cares, neither on earth or in heaven. One is left to stew in one's own dirt and one's own thoughts. Inside each head, a goldfish bowl, complete with live goldfish, who are trapped like his thoughts and are destined to go endlessly round and round and round within the same fish bowl. Extraordinarily potent idea of there being no exit from this hell on earth. Uh, con uh, consider also this work, Jean Tang Li's Homage to New York which was exhibited and destroyed in 1960. It was essentially about all kinds of movement and activity and noise and excitement, which then ends in a complete silence when the thing self-destructs. A metaphor, perhaps, of life without God, of hell on earth, noise and confusion. Uh, images, again, which go back to medieval hell themes. Jerome Witkin has plundered and updated the repertory of medieval torture scenes of hell. In view of the Holocaust, how could some artists fail to conceive of human existence as a form of hell on earth? After all, and this really struck me as I was thinking about this, Scripture speaks of the devil as the prince of this world. So his worst workings on earth may well in fact serve as a chilling foretaste of eternal hell 
It is a prospect that should turn all of us to repentance. So Whitkin's painting here entitles it Unseen and Unheard. Notice the man on the telephone who blocks his ears to blot out his screams and subtitles it in memory of all victims of torture, done in 1986. A naturalized heaven and hell on a 20th century triptych was created by Max Beckmann, the German artist, in 1932-33. It's called The Departure. For me, it's perhaps one of the most memorable of all naturalized visions of heaven and hell in the secular art of the 20th century. It was made in the 30s. It was work forged amidst the brutal agony of post-World War I Germany, drenched in a pervasive air of disillusionment. At the same time, he and his countrymen were being threatened by the rising specter of Nazism, when violence and cruelty impregnated the air with the stench of torture and death. The somber tones, the dense spaces, the shocking imagery of the triptych, notice again it's a triptych, a Christian altarpiece format, of these, the side panels, the somber tones of these, they evoke a clamorous and claustrophobic hell, alas, only too close to the sordid reality of the dark corners of Beckman's own country. Perhaps, in a way, they were prophetic images, too. By contrast, the central panel warmed by the intensity of the red, yellows, and blues, feature a hooded boatman, a regal mother and child, and a fisherman king, who together lend a mythic tone of hope for the departure to a realm of tranquil expansiveness. Yet it remains completely ambiguous as to whether this refuge is to be found, as Beckman himself sought it, across the Atlantic Ocean in North America, that chance, or rather beyond our imaginary horizons in some once promised yet scarcely believable heaven, spoken of long ago by some uneducated Galilean fishermen who in their turn had done their fishing and rowed with their oars. The credibility of these Galilean fishermen may be uh, smothered by the seemingly more reliable knowledge of the modern astronomer and the research scientist. Yet Beckman seems to want to hope that perhaps, after all, those Galilean oarsmen can still steer us to the other side. Thank you. <laughs>